Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. I want you to uh, just take a moment and go with me, if you will, in the wonderful book of 1 Samuel. We're not going to go to 1 Samuel. We're actually going to go... 1 Samuel is a big book, so it's easy for you to find. Then right in front of 1 Samuel is a little book of Ruth. And I want you to go there with me because I want to share some truths out of the Word of God. And today we're going to be talking about a subject that I think is really important for all of us. It's called choosing life's paths. You know, you and I are going to choose a path one way or the other. If you did, stop thinking about it just for a moment. If you did nothing but sit in your bed for the rest of your life, you made a choice and that's your path. Somewhere along the line, you and I have got to get the concept that there's paths that we follow. If you follow the wrong path, you're going to end up in the wrong place. If you follow the right path of life, you're going to end up in the right place. And I know that every one of us that are in here want to follow the right path. And oftentimes we say, God, what would you have for me? Where would you have me to go? What would you have me to do? Lord, what would you have me to say? What would you have me to be? Father, show me what to do and I'll just do it. We say that over and over again. And as we say that, we've got this giant book inside of our uh, you know, car or sitting on our mantle or uh, next to our bed or on our lap. And we don't realize that this is the, if you will, map on how to find the right path in life. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God's trying to say something to you and to me. That there is a path that you will follow, and if you follow it correctly, you're going to get blessed. If you do not follow it correctly, even though you are a Christian, you will find yourself miserable, down, out, discouraged, frustrated about life. Has anybody ever known people that are Christians, and you wonder when they leave them, wow, if they're Christians, I don't know what it's like, because they're a mess. Well, the purpose with that and the reason for that is they just didn't follow the right path. There's a path outlined in the scripture for you and I to follow. And tonight, choosing that right path is very important for us. So I had you go, if you will, to a, to a little book called Ruth. When you get to Ruth, it's so fascinating because this is a story about a young Moabite woman. Not an Israelite, not a, a Jewish woman, not a Hebrew a, a woman. But a Moabite woman, it's kind of fascinating that you find something other than Israel, something other than from the Jewish faith in the scripture. They ought to really pay attention when you see this, that God thought so much of her that he actually has this book in the scripture that is anointed by God to give us insight. I think the insight that we're going to draw from is the insight of finding out what the path is all about. And we'll see by her life the things that literally wake up God to the place where God gives her a special attention and you'll find that God does some great things. I, I don't know about you, but if I'm gonna live my life out, I would really love to catch the attention of God in areas of my life. And I found in scripture, there are certain people that have done certain things and they really catch the attention of God. David was one as an example when he fought the bear and the lion on the hills of Judea. All of a sudden, you know, here he's faced with this giant. Don't think for a moment as he's standing boldly before the giant that God isn't looking and saying, look at this guy. He is a real pistol. He really caught the attention of God. Don't think for a moment that Paul and Peter, James and John didn't catch the attention of God. And in turn, they, if you will, got blessed. I want to catch the attention of God like Ruth, for an example. Let me tell you the story, and then we'll go to the scriptures. Is that all right? Because it's really a fascinating story. We sang part of it in the song tonight, but it's more than just a song, if you will. The book of Ruth describes a family, much like your family. A husband, a wife, two sons. And they're in the land, if you will, of Judah, in the land, if you will, of Bethlehem. You know the name Bethlehem and where that's from. And there's a famine in the land. Now the word famine is an unusual word for us. We don't understand the word famine very much in America. The word famine means that there's no rain in the land and there's no crops and basically what it simply means is there's no food. And people are going hungry. We don't see that 
very often in your lifetime or my lifetime in America. We've pretty much eradicated that, taken care of that issue, but there's a famine in the land. And they're not getting food that the family needs, so they decide to leave Bethlehem and go somewhere. They go to a place where it's a, 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 the Moabs are, and there they find that the Moab tribe happens to be one that is blessed by God. And the reason they're blessed by God, the scripture tells us, is because they have bread on their table. We fight so many battles, don't we? Our cars, our you know, techie phones, our, our uh, television doesn't work, our cable system. We fight all kinds of different battles. Their battle was just to put bread on the table. So because of the famine in the land, they moved to this area that's new to them with their two boys. And they're there for years. The two boys marry two Moabite women. It's kind of fascinating. They're, here they are married to these two non-Christian, excuse me, non-Jewish, if you will, women. And the husband of all of these, this, this little group of people now, the two sons, the wife, the husband himself, he gets sick and he dies. And then shortly after him dying, you'll find both of the sons dying. The wife of the father that died, his name's Naomi. And she finds herself devastated because listen to what went on in her life. Her husband died, her two sons died, she's in a strange land with two daughter-in-laws that are not even of the same faith as hers. And she decides she doesn't know anything else to do but go back to her own land. And when she goes back to her own land, she calls her daughter-in-laws in and she says, listen, I want you to know there's no hope for you whatsoever. Where I'm going, there's no men for you. Nobody will marry you. It's against the traditions. Nobody will have anything to do with you at all. No one will take care of you. No one will provide for you. No one will give you a job. You won't have anything. The only hope for you ladies is to go back to your own people. That's the only hope. If you go with me, you'll starve out. You'll, you won't make it at all. And one of the daughter-in-laws hugs the mother-in-law, leaves and goes off to her own daughter. But there's this one lady, the one daughter-in-law by the name of Ruth. She hugs, if you will, Naomi and she won't let her go. And she makes a statement and it's a brilliant statement. It's a statement, my friend, that catches the heart and eye and attention of God. Because in this statement was a path she was ready to follow that would change her entire direction. Wow, an amazing truth. If you have your Bible, go with me in the first chapter of Ruth, the 16th verse, and I'll read as if you will. Ruth is talking to Naomi, her mother-in-law, and she makes this statement in verse 16. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you. I love this because the word entreat me is like, listen, tell me not to leave you. Don't tell me to leave you. Don't tell me to go. It's like, encourage me to stay with you. She's got an attitude about her. She doesn't want to go back to her own people. She wants to stay with Naomi. Not to leave you, nor to turn back from following after you, she makes this statement. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. That is one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. Your God will be my God. What a commitment. What a heart. What a woman who is making the choice for the right path for her future. And she comes along and she makes this statement. She says in verse 17, where you die, listen to the commitment, I will die. And where you'll be buried, the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Oh my goodness, what a commitment. This commitment to her mother-in-law caught the heart of God. And as you know the story, 
Most of you know the story. She goes back to the land. There she meets one of the relatives of Naomi. His name is Boaz, and Boaz is very wealthy. She gets married, and she has Boaz taking care of her as a very rich and wealthy woman. Would have never happened if she didn't put her life on the line, making the right choice to go in the right direction and follow the right kind of a path. What you choose, listen closely to me, will determine where you go. Where you go will determine what you'll be. What you be, what you'll be determines what you'll have, and what you have will determine the outcome of your life. And God is interested in putting a story like that in Scripture so that we can see some truths about this woman, Ruth, that all of us could grow from, all of us could learn from. This is not just a Sunday school message. This is a message that tells us about where we're at in our relationship with God. Here's quite frankly, if I can just say it like this, if you follow God, you're on the right path. If you do not follow God, you're on the wrong path and you're on a path that will lead you eventually to destruction. And you may be a Christian, you may go to heaven, but I tell you what, your life will be like hell here on this earth. And somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. This is here for a reason so that you and I can choose life's paths. Now, it's not going to tell you everything, but there's some basic truths here, again, that catches the heart of God, catches the eye of God, that puts her in the right place at the right time in order for her to get blessed. First thing, let's take a look at, if we will. There's three things that I want to share with you tonight that will help you and I both together as we live out life that we need to look for when we're choosing a path in life. Number one, we need a path to look for is this. And I love this. Number one, we got to, and I, I love this word, wise choices are a wise choice. There's two types of choices you'll have in every area, every day, every week, every month, every year of your life, you will be making a choice about something that has to do with your direction and where you're going and what you're doing. Every day, after you've made your direction, after you've got solid in where you're going, after you're doing what you know to do, going where you know to go, you're still going to have to make choices in your life to get you certain places, certain times, all the time. It never, never stops. And those choices have got to be seasoned by wisdom. And I've said it to you before many times, there's two types of choices you can make. You can choose the wisdom of the world or you can choose the wisdom of God. When you choose the wisdom of God, man, it takes faith because it oftentimes isn't the wisdom and isn't the wisdom of human beings. It doesn't logically figure out. It doesn't calculate. It's one of those, if you will, crazy things that you're doing that everybody's going to say to you, you're nuts. Why are you doing it that way? But the right choice is the choice when God's in it. And that's what you and I have to see. And that's what she made. I mean, you stop and think about her life for an example. Here she is confronted with total and complete annihilation. There was no hope for her future. There was no man going to come along in our society and marry her. There was nobody going to provide for her. There's nobody going to protect her. There's nobody going to do anything but use her up and throw her away. She had absolutely no hope. The only hope she had was to go back to her own people. And yet she went against her own logic. And she follows her mother-in-law, Naomi, back to a land with a heart full of commitment. And God sees that and God's impressed with it. And God opens up doors that no man can open and closes doors that no man can close. So her practical thinking was thrown out. Her logic was thrown out. And all of a sudden now she's looking for something different than practical thinking. She's not gathering data, coming to a conclusion and making the right choice based on her feelings or her logic. 
She's now going to make the right choice based on her heart and leading of the things of God. And when she does that, wow, it just shows so much about her character. In Psalms 119, verse number 30, it says these words, the psalmist writes, I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgment I have laid before me. And for all of us, we're going to have to choose, if you want wise choices, the way of truth. What does God say? It may not fit with my feelings. It may not fit with my logic. It may not be calculated out in life's picture plans. It's not something I can really put a two plus two equals four in. But what does God say? And how does God have me to operate? Because that's the choice I need. Because when I follow God, I'm on the right path. And if I'm not following God, I'm not on the right path. My friends, God needs a people who will simply follow him. I remember years ago, I had a friend that came to me. I, in fact, married him and his wife in our living room. I'll never forget it. They were so broke. They both, the, 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 the wedding dress was white corduroy pants. They both wore matching white corduroy pants in the living room about 30 some odd years ago in our, in our living room. They didn't have money to rent the church. They had money to, for anything. They were completely 100% broke but they were in love and wanted to get married. I'll never forget the story. We married them and sent them off. Never thought much about it, but their commitment to God was unusual. They were very unusual because the usual do what's common and normal in their thinking, do what's logical in their direction, path finding. But the unusual with God is somebody who's gonna like almost like crazy follow God even though it doesn't make sense. And I'll never forget it. After a few months, maybe five or six, eight months, he came into my office and he said, Pastor, I, I need to counsel with you. And I said, okay, what's the problem? He said, it's simple as this. He said, um, and this was when I was in Lake Arrowhead. He said these words. He said, I'm a drywaller, as you know. And he says, I cannot bid against other drywall companies. They cheat, they lie. They use different products. They say they're gonna do something and they don't do it so they can lower their price and get the work. But when I bid this the right way, I bid a job, I don't get the job because I'm telling the truth. They get the job because they're liars and, and it never pans out. But I don't know what to do, I'm going broke. And you know I've been broke since the beginning. What should I do? And I, I really felt bad for him. I, I didn't know what, as a young pastor, what to, to tell him. And I told him, I said, listen, I know one thing for sure. When you serve God, God will come through for you. And I said to him, I said, you have got to continue being righteous and honest. And I said, I know you look at the logic of it. And that says, that spells big words, bankruptcy. But I want you to know that God will make a way. And I'll never forget, some six months later, he came back and he said, Pastor, I'm so busy, I don't know what to do. I said, how'd that happen? He says, here's what took place. He says, I held to truth and everybody else started failing. He says, God shut every drywaller down from Wrightwood to Big Bear. I'm the only one left. And if anybody wants on the mountain drywall, they're going to have to come to me and I give them a fair price and I'm making a lot of money. That year, within one year, he built the house. I sold him the land. It was my land. I sold it to him. And I know what he paid for the land. And he paid $300,000 cash for a house. Now, wait a minute. That doesn't mean anything 30 years ago. That's a lot of money 30 years ago. That would be like translated in your thinking, a million and a half dollars cash today. And he paid cash for that house because why? He had so much work, he didn't know what he was doing because he stuck not to the logic, but he stuck and took the right path of the things of God. And God is always looking for a people who will come along and make the right godly wise choices the wise choice is when god is involved in it in luke the 10th chapter 
At the end of the chapter, verse number 42, before I put it up on the overhead, I'll tell you the little story so you can get the scenario, if you will. Wise choices we're talking about. This is the story of Mary and Martha. Jesus comes, if you will, to Martha's house and he's going to eat there and he starts to teach. Mary sits at his feet to get the word of God and to hear what she has to say, but Martha is waiting on everybody. She's cooking, she's doing all the pickup, cleaning, she's doing all the work and she gets so frustrated that she goes to Jesus and she says, Jesus, don't you care that my sister Mary is listening to you and not helping me? Would you tell her to get off her duff and help me? And Jesus looked at her and his answer was in verse 42. Let me pop it up for you. It's an interesting answer. He says, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part because she chose the things of God, not just to do the work, but the things of God, which will not be taken away from her. You and I tonight can choose the good part. The good part is when God's involved in it. And that's what, if you will, that you will find with Ruth that made her so unusual, she chose what was right and followed God in doing it. The second thing we see in the life of Ruth, which is amazing, is we see the word commitment. If we're going to have a path to look for, let's look for a commitment. And by the way, may I say this to you? A commitment on your part means I am committed to something. I'm not going backwards. I'm not going to leave it after a while. I'm committed to it. And without that, we find ourselves failing without real commitment. Stop and think about it. If a husband and a wife aren't committed to each other, it won't be long before all of their, if you will, issues will come up and be big enough that drives the other one absolutely nuts. We've got to be committed to the relationship with Jesus Christ. And she was so committed to her mother-in-law that she makes a statement like this in verse 17. If you could pop up just verse 17 of Ruth, the first chapter, where you die, I will die. And where you're buried, come on. I mean, that's a commitment. Where you're buried, the Lord do so to me. And more so, if anything but death parts you and me. Man, that's, that's a commitment, my friends. A commitment is so important. A commitment isn't just a passive thought, isn't a suggestion, isn't something that you just, you know, do today and forget a couple of weeks or a month from now. A commitment is a commitment. God looks for people who make commitment and listen to these words and stays with those commitments. I can't tell you how many people come through Christendom, come to church, get saved, get excited, get their lives changed, be touched by God, and a few months later, you never see them again. Tens of thousands of people here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. I used to think it was my fault. It's not my fault. It's their lack of commitment to the things of God. They're like a leaf in the wind when the trials and the pressures come. The, the commitment is rocked. When the winds of life blow, their commitment is rocked. When things don't go their way, when the report from the doctor comes and it's not a good one, when their kids go south, guess what? All of a sudden their commitment now is shaken and they're no longer there. But a commitment with somebody who's gonna stay in there and be committed is what this is really all about. It's just like anything in life, without a commitment, all we have is a bunch of hot air. And hot air will get you to float around a while, but it won't get you to where you need to be. And God's looking for somebody with an amazing commitment. There's these two prophets in the Old Testament. It's kind of funny names. One's Elijah, and his, if you will, protege is a named Elisha. One's Elijah and one's Elisha. And Elisha is committed to Elijah, the older prophet. 
And he makes this statement, God's about ready to take Elijah to heaven. And so the prophet that's the old prophet Elijah says to the young prophet Elisha, I want you to stay here. And Elisha, the young prophet says, no way. Wherever you go, I'm going, I'm staying with you. You're not going to separate from me. If God takes you up, I'm going to watch you go. And he makes this statement in 2 Kings, the second chapter, verse number two. Then Elisha said to Elijah, excuse me, Elijah said to Elisha, stay in here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as for the Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. My friends, without a commitment, you don't really have a life. You're like a leaf in the wind. You're here today and blown around. If there's anything the church is crying out for, are people that are committed, people that you can trust, people that you know. And if the church is looking for people that way, how much more is Jesus looking for a stable person that you know you can count on them, that they're going to be there when the winds of life and the problems fall? There's every one of us in here going to have problems from time to time. You're going to be faced with trials and tribulations and evil temptations. I don't care how good a Christian you are, how nice you are. I want you to know that you're going to find yourself in a place where the winds of life are going to blow against you and are going to challenge your faith. Going to challenge your marriage. Going to challenge your relationship with God going to challenge everything, your job, your business, your future. It's going to challenge your decision-making process for the past. You will be challenged because I want you to know this. Before you enter into any promised land, there will always be giants in the land that want to stop you and challenge you. And you're going to have to push through the valley of the shadow of death and come out on the other side. And that's called commitment, my friends. It's not just an occasional thought. It's not trying God. It's someone who is committed to God. And God's looking for someone who's committed to him. God, this is the way it is. I don't care what the world does. I don't care what my friends do. I don't care how they act or what they say or what they do. I don't care about what goes on. I'm going on with God. That's the way I'm going. And you're committed to that. The thing that showed me the most about Ruth, if you will, was this last one, because we're looking at a path, a path for us to follow, for life, to make choices, a path to look for. Number one is wise choices, look for that. Look for a commitment towards it. But this is my favorite one. Number three, her loyalty. Loyalty means this, boy, I'm in it for the long run, no matter what. We have loyalty today when things go well. But when things don't go well, we bail out. Or we put loyalty down for a certain period of time. I'll be loyal for five years I was loyal. But now I'm no longer loyal. You guess what? If, if you don't, loyalty starts and has a finish. But there's no date for the finish. When Jesus comes, that's the end of your loyalty. And loyalty doesn't even begin until there's pressure in the relationship. Let me say it again. Loyalty doesn't even begin until there's pressure in a relationship. Without the pressure in a relationship, there is no loyalty. And I want you to know anybody can be loyal to things are going good. Anybody be loyal when their things are going right? Anybody go be loyal when there's money in your pocket and uh, everything you think is going? But let me tell you something. When toughest times come, that's when your loyalty will be tested. And a lot of people don't understand that. Loyalty doesn't even start until tough times come. Are you following me? Because without it, it just doesn't work. Jesus is a great example of loyal says these words in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse number five. Listen to the words. He says, let your conduct be without covetousness. 
Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's, that's loyalty. That's what I will never leave you nor will I ever forsake you. I will never leave you nor will I ever forsake you. Boy, if there's anybody we can put a, 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 an example to, it's got to be Jesus. And if he's that way and he's making it, let me tell you something. There's been some times in my life when I wouldn't blame him a bit for leaving. But he said, I'll never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. There's times when I thought for sure, you ought to forsake me, God. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just down and out. But he has it. And that's what makes him God. He's so loyal. And he's always looking for somebody who will be loyal also with him. My friends, three things tonight that are simple things as you choose a path for your life. Number one, will you use a wise choices to select them? It's not always how you feel or what you think or logic. Sometimes it's oftentimes contrary to your logic. Number two, will there be commitment that stays there? That's going to hold on, keep on going. A commitment that nobody's going to break, the commitment. And then three, a loyalty during times of great pressure. Will you stay the course? Will you remain loyal to your commitment? Or are you a person that's only going to be loyal as long as things go your way? Well, I tell you what, it's an amazing thing to see this lady, if you will, who becomes in the bloodline of Jesus. In the bloodline of Jesus. That's the amazing part of Ruth. All because your God will be my God. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. We do that. Isn't God good? For all of us in here, it's just something to help you get stronger in Jesus. We don't go to church to get everything all at one time. You get a little here, a little there. Something touches you, something impresses you, something moves you. You know that's for you. And that's what church is all about. We're here committed to getting you strong in the ways of the Lord so that you can be committed and to the place of loyalty, to the depth of loyalty. Man, I'm using wise decisions all the time. So it's good that God has something special for all of us as we look at the word of the Lord. Raise your hands if you got something from God. Put them down if you didn't. And so God spoke to you tonight, is that right? That's good. He spoke to me tonight too. I'm not gonna dump Debbie. <laughs> now, I, for those of you that are new, I'm just kidding. Man, I, I, that would be the, like the worst thing in the world. I'm in love with that good looking woman. I'd love her if she wasn't good looking. It's just easier to love her because she is good looking. Man. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. What do you say? Let's receive Tyson offers. And you know, commitment, loyalty, wise directions. All come, wise choices, all come with you realizing that you work every day to accumulate some finances. At the end of the week, you get a check. That check represents a lot of work on your part. Your heart beat, your sweat, your labor, your time. You paid for it with your life. Can you imagine then taking a portion of it and giving it back to God? to build the kingdom of God. What you're really saying to God, it's not the money, it's my life I'm giving. I earned it, I worked for it, I sweated for it, took some of my life, took some of my time. And now I'm giving a portion of it back to you, Lord, so that the kingdom of God can, can be advanced and go forward, doing what it needs to do. That's great. I noticed that they mentioned $25, you know, buys a meal for four. And this church is always feeding people. We're, we're an amazing group of people. And we'll feed hundreds during, from our church 
full Thanksgiving meals. Everything, all the trimmings, pies, you know, all of that stuff, all the stuffing, turkey, all that. But if you can't give $25, then stop out there at that table out there that they have and give $10 or $5 or $2 or $1. You don't have to say, well, I don't have 25, I'm not gonna give anything. Give something towards that. But tonight, that's over and above, but tonight's your tithe. Tonight's your offering to help keep the church going forward, feeding the people that we feed, missionaries from all over the world that have been with us all month long. Wasn't it wonderful? We had an amazing month, if you will. And all of those people receive money from us to help them go and keep on going forward. That's what we do here at this church. You say, how do you do that? Man, I don't know how we do it. Why do you do it? It makes no sense whatsoever. It is not logical at all. A bank came to talk to us recently. They sat down, if I mention the name of the bank, it's a very big bank. They wanted to know how we do business. <laughs> well, we give everything away. And that just does not compute with the bank. And then I finally stopped and said, that's not fair. You need to understand that we don't do business. We do church. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. Look, here's the bottom line. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. It's that simple. Somebody needs to tell you. The only way you get to go to heaven is you get born again. Whether you like it or not, that's what Jesus said. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Born again means you've given God all of your heart and given God all of your life. That's what it means. It's the right road. It's God's way. It's not yours, but that's the way it is. You have to give God all of your heart. You have to give God all of your life. Now watch this. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be, all or nothing. God forgive us in American churches that we've watered that down and played bells and whistles and smoke and incense and missed the truth. The truth is, you have to make a response to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. He won't steal it from you, he's not a crook, he's not a thief, he's not a conniver, he's not a manipulator, he's not gonna beat you over the head with a club to make you do this. It's your choice to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. If you don't do it, you're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you. It's as simple as that. And may I say this to you? Listen to this. I'll prove it to you that it's all or nothing. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. What a crude, rude statement. We always think Jesus never said anything crude or rude. He's just uh, nice, 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 nice. Well, I'm sure he is, but boy, when he needed to get into people's face, he got into their face. You brood of, uh, uh, you white sepulchers, he called them. Man, he called people names. And I want you to know something. What he said about them wasn't a lie. And you and I have to understand that God is saying something to the church nowadays worldwide. It's an all or nothing commitment. And this lukewarm stuff isn't going to make it. You're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. What's lukewarm? Well, you know who Jesus is. You celebrate Jesus at Easter and Christmas. You don't have a problem with Jesus, but you haven't given him all of your heart and all of your life. And you think you're going to make it to heaven? You're not going to make it. You can sit in a church every day of your life because it's not about sitting in the church. It's about your heart. And if you haven't given God all of your heart, 
and you haven't given God all of your life, somebody needs to tell you tonight is your night of salvation. It's that simple. You can get right with God tonight. Put all the past aside, the sins washed away. And we'll help you get on the road to strength and strong blessings because God wants to bless your socks off. But it starts with you giving God all of your heart. It starts with you giving God all of your life. It is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you haven't given it to him, I'm speaking to you. You say, well, pastor, how do I give God all my heart? How do I give God all of my life? How do I do that? Let's do it God's way, not my way, not your way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. Wow, here's another thing to listen to. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. So in a moment, I'm gonna count three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! And you hear that sound? Bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. You can put it right back down. That's simple. Your hand goes up, I'll see it. What you're doing by raising up your hand, you're saying, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to be born again. I want to be alive forevermore. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I'll see your hand, you can put it right back down. Now, who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. You know, you're going in the wrong direction. Instead of closer to God, you're kind of like hanging around, doing nothing. That's what I mean. If you've been running from God instead of to God, it's time to get ready to put your hand up and give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. If you've never given him all of your heart, you know if you have. You know, he doesn't come and steal it because you think it's happening. You can't get to heaven because you say you love God. It doesn't work that way. Guys that blew up the World Trade Center, they said they love God too. Wrong God, wrong kind of way to show love. I think they're in hell and took a lot of people with them. So my goodness sakes alive, you can't go to heaven because you say you love God. Doesn't work that way. So if you love God, guess what? Then do what he asks you to do. Give him all of your heart. Give him all of your life. If you haven't given him all of your life, then tonight is your night. You say, well, Pastor, wait a minute. You want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. I'll feel funny. My goodness, are you kidding me? I'll feel weird. People I came with will see me. People behind me will see me. I'm going to feel like totally weird. Guess what? Yep, you might. But it's better to feel weird in a safe place, isn't it, like this, than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. That's not very wise. But the devil doesn't think you're very wise anyway. So he's telling you, you don't need to get your hand up right now. And you're listening to him. Tonight is your night of salvation. God brought you here just for this. To hear a little message about what to do in life, find the right path. Simple. But guess what? And then to get into that path, you're going to have to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. Now look, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to pop my hands. It's going to sound like this. One, two, three. Bang! You hear that sound? Bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see it. Simple. Simple, simple, simple. Put it right back down. What you're saying is, Pastor, pray for me. I want to go to heaven, not to hell. And you confess it before me. I'm a man. I'll see it. What did he say? If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. You've done your job. Simple as that. Get your hand up, put it right back down. Okay, are you ready? I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. Not sit there and stare at me, but to get your hand up and give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Thank you. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Thank you. 26, 27, thank you. Back over here. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 27. Where are you? There's 28. Thank you. God bless you. Put your hand up. There's 29. Thank you. God bless you. Where's 30? Where are you, 30? You're sitting there saying, I wonder if I should. You should. I just know that. Can you just feel 30? Aren't I a greedy little pastor? I just want 30. I, I'm, we're, none of us are going home until some of you get saved. 
And uh, so, uh, where are you, 30? Get your hand up. You know you need to do it. You might as well do it. And stop messing around with God. Thank you, 30. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. You know, I've said that before. I, I've often wondered what would happen if, like, whoever's the 30, you know, or the 20, or what, if they just wouldn't do it. And, and we had to just sit here all night. You know? And then, you know, after you find out who it is that should have raised their hand up, in the morning we can beat the snot out of them for a week. No. Okay, anyways. Stop encouraging me by laughing. Okay, all of you that raised your hand, here's what I want to do. I want to pray for you. Why don't you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. No, stop. There's 30 that raised their hand. There's another 10 that should have. So if you're one of those people saying, I should have done it, yep, then you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. You can come too with the 30. I'll pray with you. You can invite Jesus in your heart. You need to do this. If you're in the family room, you raise your hand. Get out of those family room. Bring your kids. Meet me right here in front. No one leave. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come, 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 come. Jesus, I believe. Come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I belong. Just give me a couple of minutes more. I'm not going to let you go anyway for a couple of minutes. Let me just fish just for a few more moments. Can I? Just let me fish. Now, when I'm fishing, that doesn't mean you make any noise to scare my fish away. Some of you need to stop messing around and come home. Seriously. I mean, this moment that I have right now, I have because God knew you wouldn't come. He knew you wouldn't come. So he gave me the extra moment just to encourage you to get out of your seat and come. Now, someone said to me one time, you know, pastor, what I don't like about the rock is you put pressure on the people to come. And I looked at them and I said, and you think the devil doesn't put pressure on them not to come? <laughs> Hello? Worst thing I could do is sit here and do nothing. I'm really telling you, there's a few more of you that need to come. I can't make you come, and you don't want to miss this. But you know there's a sinking in your heart when these people came forward. You know you should be walking the aisle. Now, I'm just going to have them sing that song one more time, and you're going to miss out. Can you imagine this? Miss out on God. All because of what? Pride? All because you don't think you're worthy? God knows you're not worthy. I mean, if God can save me, our dirty, rotten Deborah, <laughs> she's not here. God can save you. Just come. Nobody clap. I just believe there's a whole bunch more of you that need to come. No, nobody clap. Thank you guys. Just come on. I believe there's more. Well, I could have stopped right there and said, oh, isn't the pastor wonderful? But I'm talking about your soul right now. You need to scoot out in the aisle and come. You need to scoot out in the aisle and come. Hurry, hurry, hurry. You're not hurrying.
so sorry for you. Well, I love you. God loves you. That's most important. Just come. Yeah, come on. See, every time I'm ready to quit, God brings people. Well, I'm ready to quit again. Who else is coming? See, if we'd have stopped a few moments ago, four people, if they'd have gone home and died, they'd been in hell. That's it. You don't go to heaven because you came to church tonight. You go to heaven because you're born again. Anybody else? Come on. All right. Well, thank God you guys have come. I want you to look over to your left. See this guy waving at you. His name is Pastor Joel. He's really a good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's just going to take you in the back room and beat the snot out of you until you are filled. I just had to say that. You know what I mean? Because everybody's wondering, like, what are they going to do? You know, the Frico Church, you know? Uh, so no, he's going to pray with you. That's the first thing he's going to do to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And it's a good thing. And then he's going to give you some free information to take home and read about what to do next now that you're a Christian. What does God expect? And thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. He'll tell you what that's all about. Take advantage of it. It's for your future. Take advantage. Don't just come up, pray, go home, never see you again. Let us become your church. In fact, if you give this church one year of your life, this church, that you've given God all of your life, but if you gave this church one year of life and you came to church on a regular basis, like once or twice every week, you would grow so strong, you would be a leader and you'd be healthy and strong and happy. Am I telling the truth? Am I telling the truth? I'm telling you the truth. But... I can't make you do that. You have to make the choice to do that. So make a commitment and be loyal to your commitment. You know what I mean? Okay, make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.